What if you could go to jail for having a bad thought? Do you understand that's not something that is in the movies? That's real. We're going to talk about that coming up next on I'm Right. You know what it was like in East Germany under communism? Have you ever looked into it? A lot of people know about the Berlin Wall falling down and a little bit about West Germany and East Germany and the differences and whatnot. But let's do just a brief explainer on that before we get to Facebook and Joe Biden and Jen Psaki and censorship here. What it was really like? Because the West was free and East Germany that were run by the, the communists. What it was like in the East? You know that you could and often were arrested for having a bad thought. Now, what qualifies as a bad thought? What could get you locked up in the slammer with your fingernails pulled out, even shot sometimes? One complaint about the country. Not even complaining about the Communist Party specifically. You didn't have to get caught saying, these commies are scum. I think we should revolt. If you walked into the often empty grocery stores and looked around and said, this sucks, I wish we had more food, that would be enough to get you thrown in jail. Americans, you and I, have been blessed to live in a country where we've had mostly free speech for a long time. And because we've been blessed enough to, to only know that, right? that's all you know, that's all I know, we think that is just for everyone, that everyone lives that way. We don't understand how the other half lives. Across the world, in many nations today, having a bad opinion can get you thrown in jail. It can. And I want you to understand something. I need you to understand something before we go into Joe Biden and, and Saki and what the system is doing right now and what they've been doing. Before we go into all that, I need you to understand the people here we're about to talk about, who are right here, the people running your country, there is no difference whatsoever between them and any other totalitarian who ever lived. They're only missing the opportunity to do those things. Rest assured, if these people had the ability right now to take you and throw you in jail for not doing and saying and thinking what you were told, they would do it without hesitation. They would not lose one minute of sleep while they did it. In the minds of these people, all of them, everyone running your country now, which sucks, in the minds of these people, the enemy is not China. It's not uh, Islamic terrorists somewhere. It's not Russia. It's not North Korea. The enemy is you. You had better wrap your mind around that. You are the enemy. If they had to attack, if they had total freedom to attack with the military, one entity in this world, they would attack you. That's a fact. Here's Joe Biden going off on Facebook. Facebook, who, I mean, not exactly a conservative organization, they've let people talk about the vaccine. The goods, the bads, the, you know, with everything, there's good and bad. They've just let people talk about the vaccine. I understand with limitations, they've done plenty of censorship on their own. Well, with all the censorship Facebook has done, Jen Psaki and Joe Biden, they look at Facebook and they think they haven't done near enough. COVID misinformation, what's your message to platforms like Facebook? They're killing people. I mean, it really, they are, look, the only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated. And, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. He tried to walk those comments back a little bit today, but I want you to understand something, because this goes way beyond the vaccine, and we'll get into some of the misinformation Democrats have spread here in a second. I want you to understand this, because the most important thing for the right right now is not a specific issue. It's not vaccine or taxes or spending or abortion or anything else. The most important thing the right has to get and hasn't gotten yet is the mentality of these people. Think about this. I want you to think about this. Last four years, five years, think about the absolute censorship you have seen. Whole social media accounts wiped out. People having lost their jobs. Time and time and time and time and time again, thought from the right has cost you a, a money, a job, a social media account. 
I want you to think about all that you've seen. I know you're outraged about it. So have I been. We've talked about it a thousand times on this show. With all that censorship and all that banning, this is the mentality of the American communist. They look at all of it. They don't even see the ones who've been banned. All they see are the ones they haven't gotten banned yet. That's how these people think. They never celebrate a win. They never get to a point and say to themselves, nice, we did it. All they see, all communists see, is what they haven't been able to destroy and infect and infest yet. That's how these people think. And remember, all this malarkey, to use a Joe Biden term, about misinformation, it has absolutely nothing to do with misinformation. These people, they've made a career of misinformation. So let's just say there's a vaccine that is approved and even distributed before the election. Would you get it? Well, I think that's going to be an issue for all of us. If and when the vaccine comes, and it's not likely to go through all the tests that needs to be and the trials that are needed to be done. When we finally do, God willing, get a vaccine, who's going to take the shot? Who's going to take the shot? You can be the first one to say, put me, sign me up. They now say it's okay. That's what they were saying. Now that Donald Trump won't get any credit for it, and they will, they'll say the opposite. You must understand, these people don't ever tell the truth. Nothing is ever about what they're talking about. They're not talking about the vaccine. They're talking about control. They're talking about the ability to shut you up. Because as long as you're allowed to go out there and voice the truth, they want you to shut up. They can't handle it, just like communists have always done. Just like the East Germans did when they were chucking people in dark cells for just complaining about bread. Jen Psaki, don't forget the Jen Psaki who has been pictured with a hat on it that has a hammer and sickle. Well, Jen Psaki had this to say. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook uh, that spread disinformation. We're working with doctors and medical professionals to connect uh, to connected medical experts with popular with popular who are popular with their audiences with uh, with accurate information and boost trusted content. So we're helping get trusted content out there. There's about 12 people who are producing 65 percent of anti-vaccine misinformation on social media platforms. All of them remain active on Facebook despite some even being banned on other platforms, including Facebook, ones that Facebook owns. Third, uh, it's important to take faster action against harmful posts. As you all know, information travels quite quickly on social media platforms. Sometimes it's not accurate, and Facebook needs to move more quickly to remove harmful, uh, uh, violative posts. Posts that will be within their policies for removal often remain up for days. That's too long. The information spreads too quickly. They're, they're, they're just the same. America's communists are just the same. How widespread does Jen Psaki want this? I mean, surely she's just an American Democrat, right? Well, listen, and you tell me. Uh, providing uh, for, for Facebook or other platforms to measure and publicly share the impact of misinformation on their platform uh, and the audience it's reaching. Uh, also with the public, with all of you, um, to create robust enforcement strategies that bridge their properties and provide transparency about rules. You shouldn't be banned from one platform and not others uh, if you are for uh, uh, providing misinformation out there. Misinformation. Has to be accurate, has to be truthful, right? Well, man, if we're banning people who spread misinformation, somebody better go after this person. This person's pushing a Russian bounty hoax. Remember that whole Russian bounty hoax from Afghanistan? Who, what is this person's name here? It's, uh, oh, it's Jen Psaki. Okay, well, let's set that aside. There's another person. This person definitely should be banned because this kind of misinformation... Whew, this is flat out dangerous. This person spread a rumor about Michael Flynn and Russia and how they're tied together. What's that name on there? Gosh. Oh, man, that's that's also Jen Psaki. Here's another one. Now, this this is really bad because keep in mind, keep this in mind. The president of the United States of America, Joe Biden, his son, Hunter Biden, got caught in some really, really ugly stuff before the election. And 
the media censored it. And I mean, some people were out there spreading misinformation. This person's, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's also Jen Psaki. Remember this, remember, remember, remember this. It's not about misinformation. It's not about truth. It's not about coronavirus, coronavirus, mass shootings, taxes, inflation, spending, anything else. It's all about power and control. That's all it's about. You are the enemy to these people. That's a fact. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I'm right. Now, we have some foreign aggression that we really, really, really need to talk about. Uh, not because I think you care as much about foreign policy. I don't care as much about foreign policy, but because this stuff gets pretty important from time to time. But first, home title theft is not a joke. It's not just something that takes place once in a while. This is the online crime right now. They are taking people who own homes, they're hacking into their home titles, which are online, and they're wiping people out. Listen to this guy. Nobody thinks that I can take their house and borrow against the house. Oh, no, I have title insurance for that. No, it's, it's in my name, or he would have to get some special document. They would call me. You know, nobody's calling you. After I've stolen the title, borrowed against it, or sold the property, or done whatever I've done with it, it's 60 to 90 days to even figure out that, that they're the victim of this crime. You know, by that point, you start getting foreclosure notices, and you realize you've got four mortgages on your house. Not only that, you don't even own your home anymore. It's not even in your name. Don't let it happen to you. Go get Home Title Lock. They will detect any tampering and stop it immediately. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. That's HomeTitleLock.com. Make sure you use the promo code RADIO. That gets you 30 days for free. We'll be back. Have you ever heard of Gavrio Princip? If you've heard of him, right now you're nodding your head and you know exactly where I'm going. If you haven't, just sit tight for about a minute here while we do a little rewind. Gavrio Princip was just a kid, 18, 19, 20 years old. I believe he was 20 at the time. What did he do? He assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand for the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Where is all this going? That assassination by a man you've probably never heard of before, assassinating a man you've probably never heard of before, that started World War I. You see, when we look to the past and we think about these huge, horrible world wars, World War I and World War II specifically, we look at all the carnage and the bombs and the blood, and the, it was terrible, terrible. But we think, wow, these have must all, I mean, really must have been major, major stuff that sparked all that. No, that's not how it works historically through any war, through any terrible thing that happens. Oftentimes, it just takes a tense situation and then a wee little spark thrown into the powder keg, and that's all that happens. We have to be aware of something right now, and this is going to apply, so pay attention. We, our naval force, we cannot approach China. We can't take them. Now, they can't take us, but we can't take them either as it stands right now. That's the way it sits. They're just, their defenses are strong and our defenses are strong. A lot of that has to do with long-range missile technology. If their missile can hit your ship sooner than your plane can go hit their ship, well, they're going to win. That's kind of the way that works. But there's a problem. If we can't go take them, okay, that sucks. If we aren't willing to take them on, that really sucks. And if China, who has imperialist dreams, remember, remember, and China doesn't make any bones about this. It's not like China denies who they are. China pretty much is out there saying, yeah, we, we run, a, run the world. We think we should run the world. We think we're the best. If we can't stop the big bully from being a big bully, well, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. I had a national security friend of mine I trust very much tell me not long ago. They said, I could see easily China taking advantage of Joe Biden's idiocy and just taking Taiwan. 
They've wanted it forever. They already consider it theirs. If you even mention the, mention the word Taiwan, you can get in deep, deep trouble in China. They want Taiwan. They want it bad. And now they're leveling threats against other major nations like Japan, threats we really should pay attention to. 我们在解放台湾时，如果日本胆敢武力干预，哪怕出动一兵一卒、一机一舰作战力量，我们不是对等还击，而是对日本全面开战、首战用核弹、连续用核弹，直到日本第二次宣布无条件投降。For those who didn't take speed reading, let me paraphrase. That was China openly saying, if they send one soldier. One ship, one plane. We're not only going to reciprocate; we will drop nuclear bombs on Ch- on Japan. You don't level threats like that against other major nations internationally, unless you're deadly serious. But what I'm go- where I'm going with this is this: Taiwan. I don't expect you to care about it, but you should. Computer chips are huge. We rely on those computer chips for virtually every part of our technology, and we're going to talk to Inez Stepman about this in just a little bit. These computer chips are huge. They're made in Taiwan. China doesn't just want Taiwan because it believes historically it should have Taiwan, that it has the right to Taiwan. By the way, if you want to know how China lost Taiwan, you're going to have to look into the opium wars with the British. It's a long story. I'm not getting into it right now, but they believe Taiwan's still theirs. They want us to stop having access to those computer chips, and there's not another military in the world that can stop them from taking Taiwan if they want it. Yeah, they're under the protection of the British. The British can't do it. The Japanese, much as I love Japan and love the Japanese people, they are forced to take a nuclear bomb threat uniquely serious because they've gone through that before. That's a long way of me saying, this is the kind of thing that could spark a world war. It is. There. Sleep well after that. You know we have an app? There's a First TV app. Not only can you watch me and all of our great programming live, you can get it on demand. Just go get the First TV app from the App Store and get me whenever you want. Gosh, how blessed are you? We'll be back. We also know that as our economy has come roaring back, we've seen some price increases. Some folks have raised worries that this could be a sign of persistent inflation. But that's not our view. Our experts believe, and the data shows, that most of the price increases we've seen are were expected. Everything's going fine, didn't you hear? Joining me now to talk about that is Ken Blackwell. He's the Secretary of State for Ohio. He's also the former mayor of Cincinnati and part owner of the Cincinnati Reds. Ken, I bet you didn't know the economy is the best ever. <laughs> Joe Biden must be akin to the Mad Hatter of uh, Lewis Carroll fame. And we've gone through the looking glass and he's trying to convince us what is up is down and what is down is up. That was just hilarious but it is also very, very dangerous as you now have an administration trying to gaslight the American people into not acknowledging the fact that he is deconstructing our constitutional republic, crashing our economy, and moving our nation very rapidly to the ash bin of history like all other nations that have in fact had a status form of government. We have to push back, Jesse. We cannot let this stand, and we cannot be blinded by this sort of stupidity. Joe Biden is stuck on stupid. He is, he is, Ken, and I'm glad you brought it up because what what drives me crazy is the level of, I mean, as long as we're attacking misinformation, the level of misinformation that is now permitted by Democrat politicians because everyone in the media is on the left, everyone in Hollywood's on the left. I mean, half the pe- 99% of sports, at least the sports media is on the left now. We'll get to that in just a second. But they're allowed to say outright lies now and get away with it because no other part of the culture will check them on it. Joe Biden launched his campaign talking about Trump calling Nazis very fine people. That, there's video that that's not true. It doesn't matter. They get away with it. Oh, absolutely. Look, 
Take critical race theory, which is one of the flagship policies of this administration. You know, they claim to be against racism, but they are sponsoring state-sponsored racism. That's what they're advancing with this critical race theory nonsense. You know, it is a classic divide and conquer technique of bureaucratic elites that like to run status forms of government. Whether you're talking about Venezuela, the former Soviet Union, or communist, the Communist Party of of of, of China, uh, the masses suffer while the bureaucratic elite prosper. Ken, sports. Now this is this one goes to my heart. Obviously, you're part owner of the Reds, but I used to love sports. Grew up watching them. I watched them forever. All Star Game, second lowest ratings in history. People aren't watching the NFL like they used to. They're not watching the NBA at all. Sports has taken an absolute nosedive at a time when most people, well, more people are home now than have been. I know why I think it is, but you're the man with the team. What do you say? Well, look, you can't call your fan base racist. You can't, you know, you can, uh, a corporation, an individual, a, a, a league, you know, can can stand against racism. But when you, in fact, make a false charge and you paint your fan base with that false charge, you must expect this sort of negative fall fallback or, 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 or pushback, blowback. Look, the, here, here's the reality. With the All-Star Game, you had a city, Atlanta, that was looking forward, had been planning on $100 million or more being pumped into their economy so that they could help, that would help rebound from the the, the devastation of, of, of COVID. They move it to Denver, Colorado, has about a 9% uh, black uh, population, but that, that's not the point. The point is that if you compare them, uh, Colorado's uh, election policies and practices with the reforms that were advanced in Georgia, Colorado and Denver are more restrictive. And so these guys got caught in a lie. And the, look, their fan base is not is not dumb. You know, they, these these are not knuckle dragging low IQ, low IQ folks. And they're saying you can't do this. You can't you you, you can't call us racist because what we want is election integrity. We want a tight chain of custody of ballots. We, in fact, want a verification system that says, you know, that that helps prove that a voter is who he or she claims to be. And you then can't say that we are racist because we embrace photo ID. If I left you will call tickets at the will call window to come and see a Cincinnati Reds game to get those tickets, Jesse, what would you have to show? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 yeah. You know, people are not going to, you know, people are not going to take this line down. You know, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass once said, "Those who are whooped easiest are whooped most often." And what I Oof. know about Americans is that we are not an easily whooped people. And it, what we're going to do is start fighting back against these woke corporations, whether it be. Coca-Cola or Delta or American Airlines. You know, they, they, just, they just need to stop it. Speaking of Coca-Cola, you posted on your social media a great video I want to post for the people here real quick. We've taught the world to sing in perfect harmony. Just drink Coke, the road to obesity. We say we're woke, we sell drinks, badass smoke. China is our labor supplier that drives our stock price even higher. What the world knows today, obesity won't go away soon. Diabetes is here to stay. That's a real thing, Coca-Cola. 
gosh. All right, Ken, I have to ask. Obviously, you're a very successful man. That goes without saying. Former Secretary of State, owner of the regs, so on and so forth. Even if you're a card-carrying communist sitting in a corporate boardroom, whether it be Major League Baseball, Coca-Cola, or anywhere else, you still want to make money, right? Where are the adults in the room? You just brought up Major League Baseball. Where are the adults in... Uh, Major League Baseball has smart, successful people in there. There's nobody to say, uh, we're not leaving. That's going to cost us a bunch of money and fans. Sit down and shut up. Are there no adults anymore? Oh, yeah. And let me just tell you, some folks are starting to look at how this nonsense has hit the pocketbook of these corporations and, and, uh, and these Major League Sports franchises. Look, it is very, very clear that uh, we've had, our pushback has had some impact. If you take a look at where Coca-Cola was two months ago, where Delta Airlines, American Airlines were two months ago and where they are today, uh, you, you will see that they have in fact quieted down, started to move towards a rational approach to solving our nation's problems. What the folks in Coca-Cola need to understand is that in the mid 60s, Dr. King summed it up. He said, we, can, we as a people can choose chaos and division, or we can choose community and getting things done. Uh, they in fact bought into the leftist notion of divide and conquer and chaos. And they now understand that they're starting to have an impact on their bottom line. And you're starting to see them modify their behavior. But my, 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 my position on it, not to let up until the job is complete. They must, in fact, have a rebirth of common sense and decency. Amen. Ken, I'll be looking for my will call tickets. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. We got Inez Stepman coming up talking about more CRT stuff. Hang on. Freedom. That's what they want in Cuba. Freedom from disgusting communism. Joining me now to talk about that and many other things, the senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, Inez Stepman. Inez, are they, are they complaining about lack of vaccines? No, they're, they're shouting for freedom. Um, and of course, this the way that this has been treated in the U.S. media reminds me very much of, of how the Soviet Union um, was treated by the New York Times at the time um, and, and leftist media at that time, which was to say that any problems that the Soviet Union had were downplayed or covered up, particularly by Walter Duranty, even covering up the Holodomor, which was the starvation, purposeful starvation of millions of Ukrainians, uh, because they didn't want to point the finger at the system. They didn't want to point the finger at the leftist communist system uh, that has created the kind of scarcity uh, that Cubans have had to endure for decades, that's created the political repression that Cubans have had to endure for 62 years. That's inconvenient for the left to say that because, of course, um, not only have they praised Fidel Castro's regime in the past, uh, and, and there are numerous examples of that, they, they hold some of the same ultimate, uh, you know, ideological underpinnings um, as the left in America, or at least as the far left in America. So it's inconvenient for them to see that communism has once again failed. And as uh, this thing looks big now, when it first came out, I was obviously, I mean, I'm rooting for him. I'm praying for him. Go, go Cubans. But you never know how big this thing's going to get before they start throwing people in jail and pulling their fingernails out. It's still going. Apparently, it's big enough to be scaring the government. Do you have any idea how big it is yet? It's very, very difficult to know because, of course, Internet access on the island is very spotty. What we see are usually from um, people who have managed to find a workaround. Uh, the, the government has shut down total Internet access on the island, but then has brought it back intermittently, back and forth. So it's bottom line, it's very, very difficult to tell. Um, what is going on in the island of Cuba right now. What is certain is that uh, a lot of Cuban expats, the Cuban diaspora in the United States and elsewhere, they definitely see this as a, um, a big opportunity, a big moment, something they haven't seen for the past 62 years. I mean, there's always been some kind of 
Um, uh, you know, obviously there have been people who oppose the regime there in Cuba for a very long time, but they see this as fundamentally different. There is something broad-based happening in Cuba. And, you know, it's, it's not just in Cuba, right? Um, we saw the same thing repressed in Hong Kong. Um, people carrying the American flag uh, because the American flag still around the world does stand for uh, liberal democracy. It stands for, um, you know, liberty and, and um, rights of, of human beings. Uh, it stands against repressive systems. This is the symbolism that most people around the world understand uh, in the American flag. Of course, the American flag is now officially controversial back home, um, but we've seen similar kinds of protests uh, also in, in Belarus. Um, so th there are people all around the world who are living under repressive systems, whether communist or otherwise, uh, who are willing to risk their lives for, for liberty, but it's too early to tell uh, how long this or how effective these protests will be, whether or not they'll, they'll fully succeed in overthrowing the Castro regime there. And as I have my own beliefs on what we should do as far as Cuba goes, as far as the government getting involved, I don't think we should do really hardly anything, especially not sending troops down there. But obviously we want to back them. Tell me, one, am I all wrong? Do you think we should send in the troops? And two, if I'm right, what can we do? I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I don't think this is um, a moment for American military intervention, but there are a lot of things the United States can do that are short of sending troops, right? Um, we can, for example, set up internet access on the island. We can allow uh, from offshore, we can allow these protesters to fully communicate and get the word out, which is what they're asking for right now, actually. They they want, um, they're asking Americans to, to pay attention to what's going on in Cuba, to, to use their social media accounts, which are now as I said, blocked in most of Cuba to, to put out the stories um, of what's happening on the island. Um, but it's it's really, um, it's a difficult call. I definitely don't think that, you know, the United States is obligated to spill blood and treasure for the liberty of, of other nations. Um, but here we have, we certainly have that obligation um, to, be a, to be a symbol of liberty ourselves. And there's a reason that the American flag, as I said, is such a, a popular uh, icon of, of freedom around the world. Um, and, and so it wouldn't hurt us uh, to, to more quickly than the Joe Biden administration has. Ultimately, he did criticize communism, but it took him many days to do so. There's certainly uh, very little cost to us to, to standing up um, at least um, and, and calling it what it is, which is an uprising against a brutal communist dictatorship. Uh, look, in the USSR, I hate to return to this example, but it, it, it gave a lot of people hope and courage to hear Ronald Reagan call it what it was, the evil empire. It, it is an encouragement to people in these kinds of regimes to hear the people in the United States, particularly people like the president, speak out and tell the truth about the regime under which they're living. That that actually makes an enormous difference in itself. So I don't think we need to send troops there, but I think there are a lot of things we can do short of that, whether that's you know, um, looking at, at freezing accounts of oligarchs in Cuba, whether that's looking at, um, you know, making sure to project uh, internet service. I'm obviously not a tech person, but projecting the ability to, um, you know, to, to create like an internet service on the island um, after the regime has shut it down. Those sorts of things I think we should do because we do stand as a, a beacon of liberty in the world still today. That's still how most of the world sees us. And as speaking of tyrannical regimes, China, obviously China is disgusting and communist and imperialist and they're aggressive, but they seem to be turning that aggression up quite a bit. China leveling a threat to nuke Japan if they get involved in the Taiwan conflict is quite an escalation and one I take actually very seriously. Should I or is this just a bunch of talk? No, I, I mean, I think that China is is pressing its advantage, right? Um, the West is obviously weak right now. The United States is weak right now. We're, we're internally divided. Um, and, and I think rightfully we're concerned with our own future right now. Um, and they're pressing that advantage as, as uh, expansionistic, um, you know, evil empires tend to do. Uh, now, I wouldn't take this as an idle threat, no. I, I, I think that they're very clear on the fact that they want to expand their sphere of influence. Taiwan obviously falls under what they see of, as their sphere of influence. They want it back. Um, that is a, I, I'm not a, a military expert, but that is definitely a potential flashpoint for World War III, right, in, in Taiwan. And actually one, um, one thing that I read that I think is worthwhile to share is that um, about half of the capacity to manufacture uh, computer chips uh, is in Taiwan, i.e. the United States. We rely for a lot of the, the technology that we make, we rely on um, factories 
in Taiwan that make these kinds of chips, like that could be a real security concern for the United States if Taiwan were to fall to China, right? And all of that capacity and all of that manufacturing were to fall to China, um, that would that would increase concerns that are, we already have about the fact that um, a lot of, of, for example, 5G companies are are um, connected to China or even are, are Chinese companies controlled by the government. Uh, it would not be a good thing for the United States to allow, you know, a large percentage of the technological manufacturing that happens in Taiwan to, to fall under the, the regime of the CCP. Yeah. The problem is I don't think we have the Navy that can go over there and actually do anything about it anyway. All right, and as I want to play you this video of someone from Facebook. How do you find that balance between uh, human rights uh, and free, free speech versus a human rights, uh, but also other human rights, because obviously free speech is not an absolute human right. It has to be balanced with other human rights. And that is what the oversight is there uh, to do. And as who's going to balance free speech for us? That's always the question, right? Who decides what's misinformation? Um, no, what we see here is a very, very clear um, in the last several days has actually, I think it's been very clarifying and useful. We've seen um, government officials, both in the US and in other countries, make it very clear that they are essentially calling on private companies to do the kind of speech regulation that they as government are forbidden from doing, right? So the US, uh, you know, US Constitution, the First Amendment forbids the government from censoring speech. But what we have here is a very clear collusion where the government is directly telling private companies, we can't do this, but you can and you will. Uh, right. So it, this, this is actually one of the claims that um, President Trump, um, his lawyers raised in that lawsuit that was filed recently. I'm very interested to see where those claims go. Um, I, I, I think that they um, have a lot of merit. They are new. They're novel. They're not going to be um, it, it immediately accepted by the courts. It, these, this is sort of um, uncharted waters for the court. Uh, but I do think that it, it brings up a real constitutional question, which is can the government essentially circumvent the Constitution by uh, nod, nod, wink, wink, uh, you know, intimidating and and or asking private companies to do the exact same thing for them. I and mean, that's really what's at issue here. And as, why didn't the Trump administration do anything about this? I, I, we had the presidency, House and Senate for two years. Why was nothing done about this when we had something we could do about this? Because now we can't do anything, but you and I complain over text message. I think there are really two reasons for that. Um, one uh, is is that you know Trump, uh, unfortunately, I think often was distracted by personal thin skin considerations. Like it is look, he's a funny guy. I I did not mind list, uh, watching him dunk on people uh, on media figures on Twitter. Uh, but but I don't think that uh, he actually used all of the power that he had in front of him in a serious way to tackle some of the larger questions. And perhaps we shouldn't blame him for that because I'm getting to, to reason number two, which is that the Republican Party has had absolutely backwards priorities for decades, right? Um, it's not that I'm opposed to low taxes. I think low taxes are great. I think they, you know, grow the economy and all that, you know, all that yada yada that we hear all the time, sort of warmed over Reaganism. Um, by the way, I think Reagan was a much more uh, sophisticated and important figure than the like repetition of of a creed that has become sort of this this um, Reaganite creed, this divorce. I think in many ways from from Ronald Reagan's presidency. But that's that's an aside. Um, we've seen the right more broadly and the Republican Party specifically pour all of their political capital into essentially issues of lower or higher taxes, issues of deregulation. Again, I don't oppose any of these things, but um, at the same time, they allowed the left completely free reign in all of the institutions that create culture. So they let the left run rampant through the, the academy that therefore uh, spilled over into the K-12 system. The left has run the K-12 system um, for several decades now. We're seeing that bear fruit with the, the views of my generation, the millennials, and, and the views of Gen Z, right? All they know is this narrative uh, that, that America is uniquely evil, uh, that there's nothing exceptional about this country unless it's that it's exceptionally bad and racist. Um, so we let the left have free reign there. We didn't focus any political capital there. We didn't focus any political capital um, on anything else, on building any kind of actual opposition to the cultural drift where it left. And, and now we're seeing the fruit of that. Uh, where, where we do have large percentages of the country that believe things like uh, that the U.S. is uniquely evil, that the United States invented slavery. That's that's a new one um, on me, but apparently 30% of college grads believe that the United States invented slavery. Um, 
So, I mean, instead of focusing on those things, which are ultimately much more important for to, to preserve a republic um, and to, to preserve a citizenry that's capable of self-government, we put all of our political eggs since the Cold War, basically, in you know lower taxes and deregulation. And that wasn't enough to save off the cultural takeover. That's the big mistake oh. of the Republican Party for the last 35 years. And I'm not sure that that's Trump fine. really reversed that, although there were some glimmers of it. I think he, he, did, he was an important sort of breaking point. Um, but... I, in terms of practical policy, I'm not sure he really delivered on a lot of the sort of heterodox thinking that he promised in his campaign. And as Stepman, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Time to lighten the mood. Next. I can't play music. Did I ever tell you that? I know you're going to find this shocking because you're sitting there thinking, Jesse, you can do anything. And obviously, for the most part, that's right. But anything artistic, I can't do it. It's a Kelly thing. Nobody in my family can. We can't draw. We can't sing. We can't dance. Can't play instruments. We can't do anything. And so while I admire this person in the video I'm about to show you, I've got to be honest, I'm a little resentful. <laughs> thinking impressive still i wish i could add just a little bit of that talent i'll see you tomorrow